Epcot's rides will take you into space, under the sea, on the racetrack, and around the world. But which ones do you need to prioritize? And how will you be able to ride them all in one day? Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. The rides you're gonna find over in Epcot are thrilling, educational, and sometimes even both. Edgy, thrilling, thrillcational. I'll come up with something better later. So what we're gonna do is rank them all on a scale of one to 10, as well as discuss the pros and cons of each experience. Cause even though the DFB team and I might claim a ride to be a perfect 10 out of 10, it might not be the best ride for you and your group. And you know, vice versa. By the end of this video, you'll know which rides you've got to prioritize when you visit and which ones are very, very skippable. There's one ride in here in particular that I've kind of exiled from here on out. See if you can guess which one. Couple of things to note before we get started. First off, we are not talking about shows or other attractions today. So Harmonious and Impressions de France are off the hook for now. Secondly, we'll also be talking briefly about which rides use Disney Genie Plus and individual attraction selections for each entry. If you're unfamiliar with the system, I'd recommend checking out our past videos that go a little more in depth on how this planning tool works or take a look at our continuously updated page on the DFB website that talks all about the My Disney Experience extension, Disney Genie. But let it be known that you do not need to purchase Disney Genie Plus for $15 per person to get on the Epcot rides, and you especially don't need to worry about it for Epcot. Let me show you why. Throw your hands in the air, it is time to ride. All right, we're starting in World Celebration. Good times. World Celebration gives us plenty to celebrate when we walk into the land. I mean, it's the home of the big golf ball beauty itself, Spaceship Earth, which wins it automatic points. You're not going to find any big thrills here unless you consider big thrills to be dark tunnels and outdated animatronics, but what you will find are classic experiences that people either love or take a nap on which could mean they love it too, who knows? Both of these rides do have Genie Plus capabilities, but neither one really needs it, unless you're going during peak holiday times, and even then, they may still be manageable. So of course we're gonna start with Spaceship Earth. If you can read the description of this video, thank the Phoenicians. Spaceship Earth is a 16 minute Omni Mover dark ride that takes you on a journey inside Spaceship Earth, that geodesic sphere icon of the park, Walt's weenie for Epcot, and across the timeline of communication to see just how far we've actually come. Each scene, aside from the beginning one where the dawn of civilization is teaming up against a gigantic woolly mammoth, features animatronics and intricate background design work. You'll also smell the burning of the Library of Alexandria, which is both depressing and satisfying. And we have a little discussion about it here on the DFB team from time to time because some people think that that makes them feel hungry and others of us, like me, think that's just bizarre. Anyway. Let us know in the comments. Once you've made your journey up inside Spaceship Earth, your Omni Mover will slowly rotate backwards to take you back down through a starry tunnel. While this is happening, the screen in front of your ride vehicle will come to life and prompt you with a choose your own future activity. The ride takes your picture at the start to insert you into the choose your own future story at the end, but don't think about it too hard. The camera tech's pretty outdated and will often cut out chunks of your face for the picture. This ride is charming and educational, but it's definitely in need of some TLC. Now back in 2019, Disney told us during the D23 convention that Spaceship Earth would be undergoing a major renovation, featuring great moments of human history along with a focus on storytelling rather than inventions and technology. And as much as I love the original iteration of this ride, the new ride proposal is kind of exciting too. But after the 2020 closures, these plans were postponed indefinitely, and we haven't heard any new updates since, but we'll for sure update you if the status changes. So right now, Spaceship Earth is gonna be the same old Spaceship Earth you've always ridden since you were little. Now the lines for Spaceship Earth aren't ever outrageous, and if they are, go do something else and come back later, cause they will die down. My only advice is to not make this one your first ride of the day. Lots of guests who are unfamiliar with Epcot will see that it's the first ride in the park and go ahead and jump in line. But you do not need to rope drop this ride. You'll need to rope drop other rides which are not located in World Celebration. It's also important to note that this ride has seen a lot of technical difficulties lately, so there may be times during the day when Spaceship Earth is temporarily unavailable for an extended period of time. Hey, time traveling is hard work, okay? Now after you exit the ride, you'll enter Project Tomorrow, which is a little interactive play area that's supposed to model futuristic tech, but also feels pretty dated nowadays. Definitely gives me old school Disney Quest vibes. Anyone remember Disney Quests? Good times. 
pros for this one. Best for those looking for an easygoing ride through a classic Epcot dark attraction. This is great for all you 80s kids and 90s kids out there who grew up with this ride. Lots of animatronics and details, so there's something new to see every time, and you are definitely going to learn something on this ride. Cons, not best for those who are uncomfortable with extended dark sections of rides, though the stars and choose your future activity help to break it up. And those technical difficulties that can cause this ride to have a few hiccups. Now, because I am an 80s kid and because this is literally one of my favorite rides in Walt Disney World, we're going to give this one a 9 out of 10. But it deserves it, I promise. All right, journey into imagination with Figment. Oh boy, if I had way more time on my hands, I could really go in depth behind the history of this dark ride and all the controversial changes it underwent during its lifetime. But I'm going to focus on the version we have in World Celebration today. If you want to know more about the drama llama behind Figment and friends, you can check out our rides that had to close video for more of those juicy details. Now, Journey into Imagination with Figment is all about imagination. Now, I know Bria wants me to sing that, so the imagination. There we go. During the course of this easygoing ride, Dr. Nigel Channing is trying to take you through his sensory lab inside the Imagination Institute. But his little purple dragon companion, Figment, has other ideas on how this tour should go. The ride features mind tricks, illusions, and stinky smellitizers, which pipe in skunk smell. Don't worry, the smell doesn't linger, but the memory of it does. Kiddos are either going to go absolutely bonkers for this ride or be slightly terrified of it. So expect loud noises, sudden rushes of air blown into your face, and Nigel Channing's terrifying features projected on the moon like a psychopath. As far as older kids and adults are concerned, eh, most folks ride this one to see Figment and Figment alone since he's kind of the mascot of Epcot. A lot of the warm fuzzies people have toward this ride is in memory of its original version, Rainbow Tunnel included. Otherwise, older kiddos and teens might find this one kind of cheesy. Now, I personally still plug my ears before that big reveal at the end because it terrified me when I was a little kid. Okay, so Journey into Imagination with Figment is usually a really short wait. And just like Spaceship Earth, if it isn't a short wait when you go to ride it, go to do something else and come back later. You can always check on the free version of the Disney Genie app to check on forecasted wait times for rides throughout the day. That way you can try to hit up the rides when they're predicted to be at their lowest weights. After you exit the ride, you'll enter Imageworks, the What If Labs, which is the pavilion's sensory-driven play area, but you really don't need to spend a whole lot of time here unless you have little, little ones. It's kind of neat to check out for a minute or two, but there's not much to do otherwise. That said, when my kid was like four, we were in here for hours. Okay, pros. Best for those looking for a short wait for a slow-going dark ride, and it's colorful, kooky, and good for kids. Except kids who hate loud noises and surprises, like me. Cons, not best for older kids or teens who might find the different gimmicks and imagination song kind of cringy, and it feels pretty dated at this point. Overall, we're going to give Figment 6 out of 10. All right, next it's time to go to Barf Alley. That's right, I call this Barf Alley because a lot of the rides in this particular area of the park may cause you some problems if you have motion sickness. So this is World Discovery. It's been a hot spot of activity lately, some barf related. And this area of Epcot is all about spacey, futuristic vibes like Tomorrowland over at Magic Kingdom. But World Discovery has felt a lot more high tech and futuristic than Tomorrowland lately since Epcot's expanded the area with a brand new coaster and the space centric restaurant Space 220. There are three rides in World Discovery, each of which has lightning lane capabilities, but how you approach getting a Genie Plus reservation for each of these rides is going to be different. So let's start with the ride that probably doesn't need a Genie Plus reservation at all. Mission Space. Don't move a muscle. Sorry, skipping to the end of the ride there. Let me backtrack. At the risk of sounding cliche, you're not going to find another ride quite like Mission Space anywhere else on Disney World property. This ride is a NASA-style mission simulator that assigns you a role, pilot, navigator, engineer, or commander, then puts you on a space shuttle and blasts you into space. But this is very, 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 very different from flying the hunk of junk, the Millennium Falcon. During the course of your flight, you'll be commanded to push buttons to fulfill your assigned role. But even if you don't push one of the buttons during your mission, you're not going to mess up the story or anything. It'll just automatically do it for you. If you want your role to really make a difference on the ride, you're going to have to head over to Millennium Falcon. Now, there are two versions of this ride. The Green Mission is a gentle, family-friendly assignment that takes you around the Earth and back again. You'll feel some subtle movements while you're in your capsule, but it's kind of a sleepy ride all in all. 
And then there's the orange mission. If you ever wanted to know what fruit feels like when it's being blended into a smoothie, the orange mission of Mission Space probably isn't too far off. We're talking major spinning G-forces here. This is the ride that NASA astronauts actually said feels like you're going into space, or at least it feels like you're inside the centrifuge that they use to train astronauts on how it feels to go into space, and that's exactly what this is. So if you get motion sickness of any kind, it's probably not smart to ride the orange mission on mission space. This ride is not for the faint of heart and is arguably the most intense ride, not just in Epcot, but in Disney World, period. They even provide barf bags on this ride. That's how often people get off and have to toss their cookies immediately after. It's great that Epcot does provide a second option for those who are prone to motion sickness, but the green mission really doesn't do a lot. So mission space is pretty black and white. It's either kind of dull or you're going to not want to eat again for the rest of the day. The green mission will always have posted shorter wait times than the orange mission, even if it's not technically true. If for some reason the green mission happens to be a longer wait, Epcot will still post the green mission as a shorter wait to dissuade people from jumping in line for the orange mission based on wait time alone. That's how intense the orange side is, folks. That being said, neither side is usually that long of a wait, until recently. Because of World Discovery's newest coaster, many guests tend to gravitate toward Mission Space before or after they ride the new ride. But even so, the wait times for Mission Space aren't terrible in the late afternoon. Just make sure you don't ride when you're really full or really hungry. Those NASA astronauts, they actually recommend having a banana before you ride. I don't know, they say it works. You'll exit this ride and enter into Mission Space Advanced Training Lab where you can kill time playing some space themed games or letting the little ones crawl around in the interactive space playground area. So Mission Space Pros, best for those who have a passion for all things space and thrills. And it has two versions so you can choose your level of intensity. Cons, not best for those who experience motion sickness and Green Mission can be dull for thrill seekers. There just doesn't seem to be a happy medium for this one. So overall, we're gonna give Mission Space a five out of 10. Okay, now it's the latest, it's the greatest, and it gives Space Mountain and Magic Kingdom a major run for its money. Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind is a family-friendly indoor coaster where you'll join forces with Star-Lord, Rocket, Groot, Gamora, Drax, and Terry Crews. His name's actually Centurion Tall Merrick, but we're just gonna call him Terry Crews because Terry Crews. So your ride vehicle will launch you backwards into space right from the get-go. But don't worry, this isn't a launch like you'll find at Rock and Roller Coaster over in Hollywood Studios. Instead, it builds up speed without feeling like you're about to get whiplash. That said, if the backwards portion of Expedition Everest messes with your tummy like it does mine, then we may need to talk a little bit later about that whole Barf Alley thing again. I will tell you about that in just a second. Cosmic Rewind uses screen technology to project MCU characters around the ride, which you'll be able to see thanks to the ride's 360 degree turning technology. But one of the best parts about it, you never know which song will be playing in the background during your ride through. This is a lot like the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout over in Disney California Adventure. They have a bunch of different songs and you never know which one you're gonna get for your ride. The coaster is very smooth, so don't be nervous about getting jostled too much. It's gonna be a fun one for kids, teens, and adults alike. As far as intensity goes, we place it between Rock and Roller Coaster and Space Mountain. Rock and Roller Coaster is more intense with its zero to 60 launch and upside down loop-de-loops, but Cosmic Rewind is faster than Space Mountain, reaching speeds up to 55 miles per hour. This will probably not get you feeling quite as yucky as Mission Space Orange will, but this ride does make a handful of guests very queasy because of the rotating motions, that backward action, and the screen action going on around them. So. I personally take Dramamine before I ride this ride. Not joking, I kind of have to, especially if you're gonna ride it multiple times, which you can do, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if you know you're sensitive to motion sickness and things like the backward action of Expedition Everest and Mission Space get you queasy, then you definitely wanna consider popping some Dramamine before you ride. Now, because this ride just opened on May 27th, it's currently using a boarding pass system, meaning you can't just jump in the main queue for this like you would any other Disney World ride. You're gonna have to log on to the My Disney Experience app and snag your place in the virtual queue at either 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. You can learn more about the boarding pass system the DFP website. I'll put the link in the description below. Remember, these boarding passes get snatched up very quickly, like within seconds of them going live. So you're gonna have to make sure you're on your app and ready to grab them before 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. hit. You'll also have the option to purchase a lightning lane for this one through the individual attraction selections. 
Yep, Cosmic Rewind is not listed as one of the rides featured on your Genie Plus purchase, so you'll have to pay a separate price to bypass its main virtual queue. IAS reservations also drop around 7 a.m., so be ready to purchase those if you don't want to worry about the hassle of the virtual queue. And by the way, that's how you can ride twice. You can get a virtual queue position for the free version of Cosmic Rewind, and you can buy an individual attraction selection as well, so you can ride twice if you're lucky enough to grab both of those. Now remember, if you're going to get a virtual queue position or a morning IAS position, then you need to have a park pass reservation for Epcot to get in there. All of this sounds like Greek. I imagine if you're watching this video and you don't know Disney World very well or if you've never been to Disney World, that all sounds like absolute chaos. Don't worry, we've got videos on park passes and how to book those. We've got videos on individual attraction selections and Genie Plus and virtual queues and everything you need to know to actually have a successful day in Epcot these days. They're all here. We've got you. Don't worry about it. Now, pros for Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind is the best for those looking for a family-friendly coaster that's both thrilling and smooth as butter. And honestly, on this one, your kids are probably going to enjoy it more than the adults if the adults have that motion sickness issue. I've found personally, as I get older, I have more motion sickness problems. And I think that's probably the case with a lot of folks. So your kids may do better than you on this ride when it comes to that motion sickness thing. Now, it's also a hilarious script. It's so much fun to ride this ride and hear what they have to say. It's a great soundtrack, and it's the first ever Disney World Marvel ride, so pretty awesome. Cons on this one, not best for those who get motion sickness easily, so make sure to prepare ahead of time. By the way, they do have motion sickness medication at the first aid, so if you forget to buy some or if you don't want to buy a whole pack just to ride this one ride, you can go pick some up at first aid in Epcot when you first arrive so that it's you're ready to go when you're gonna ride Cosmic Rewind. And getting a boarding pass to ride this can be very tricky. That's definitely a con. So you'll need to study up on the process before your visit. Overall, we're gonna give this one a nine out of 10. Okay, moving on to test track. Have you ever been driving on the highway and gone, man, I wish there were more neon lights and sudden stops on this road? That's Test Track. Test Track was originally a high-speed car ride that made you a test dummy in a vehicle testing facility, but at the end of 2012, the ride was remodeled to look more Tron-like, giving you the ability to customize your own ride vehicle while waiting in the queue and then competing with other car designs once you're all buckled in and on the course. The ride has received pretty mixed reviews from guests. Some love all the neon lights and sharp turns, and they especially love pushing the pedal to the metal at the end of the ride to see how fast their vehicle can race around the outdoor portion of the track. And by the way, the pedal and the metal are figurative. You don't actually press any pedals to metal. But other people feel like this is a very long wait for a glorified car ride. However you might feel about it, Test Track does rack up rather long wait times throughout the day, so it's not a bad one to grab a Genie Plus reservation for. You can also choose to rope drop Test Track for your first ride of the day, and you'll still be able to get on with minimum waits, since many other guests will be rope dropping a certain World Showcase ride instead. Or you can try getting in the single rider line. Not many Disney World rides have single rider options, but Test Track does. So take advantage of it if you're looking for a potentially shorter wait time. Just keep in mind you will be separated from your group if you choose this option as a single rider line kind of fills in gaps in other cars with single riders. One last important note for Test Track, this ride is extremely sensitive when it comes to stormy and concerning weather. Would you want to zip down the road at 60 miles per hour while it's pouring and lightning outside? Don't answer that. So check the AccuWeather app before you get in line for this one to make sure your wait time isn't going to be interrupted by inclement weather. Because yeah, they will shut the ride down even if you've waited two hours to ride it. Okay, pros on this one. Best for those who love high speed thrills and it's customizable and competitive fun. Also on pros, if you have a kiddo who absolutely adores cars like I do, you will be riding this quite a bit. Cons, not the best for those who don't want to ride something that slams on the brakes every few seconds, and lines can get long for this one, so plan accordingly. Overall, we're going to give Test Track a 7 out of 10. Okay, heading over to World Showcase from Barf Alley. 
Ready to visit 11 countries in a single afternoon? The World Showcase can make that dream come true. This is the largest section of Epcot and gives guests the chance to taste and shop and drink their way around 11 cultural pavilions. Now you could probably fill your day just exploring these areas alone, but the added rides you can find in a few of these countries are like the whipped cream, cherries, and sprinkles on an already sweet tasting sundae. Wow, Brie is kind of reaching for that, but we're going to go with it. Also, I'm not sure why Brie is taking us to World Showcase when we haven't gone to the land pavilion yet, but we're just passengers on this bus, you guys. Brie is in charge. Okay, back to World Showcase. Lightning lanes are available for two of the three rides in World Showcase, but with a catch. However, before we get into the lightning lane madness, let's talk about the classic ride that doesn't need or have any Genie Plus reservations. Grand Fiesta Tour starring the three caballeros. The Mexico Pavilion is the only country in World Showcase where most of the action's happening inside an Aztec pyramid to reflect the nighttime energy of a festive Mexican marketplace underneath the starlit sky. You'll find shops, restaurants, and a looming smoking volcano out in the distance, but you'll also find the Grand Fiesta Tour starring the three caballeros. This gentle boat ride drifts past San Angelin, San Angelin, whatever you want me to say, Restaurante, before taking you inside the show building where you'll meet Jose Carioca, Panchito, and wait, where's Donald? Turns out Donald's off on his own adventures around Mexico, meaning it's up to you and the other two caballeros to track him down. Is this ride going to send you down winding twists and turns? No. Is it going to keep you on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen next? Probably not. Is it the ride version of comfort food and zen and a massage? 100% yes. You'll float past scenes reminiscent of It's a Small World thanks to Mary Blair's design work, screen-based glimpses into different Mexico tourist destinations, so basically like all the footage from Love Boat. You remember that show? You don't remember that show. You're too young. But the cliff diving scenes from Love Boat, I promise they're the same ones that are on this ride. And a grand audio animatronic finale with the reunited caballeros. Whoops, spoiler alert. Grand Fiesta rarely racks up a large wait time, or any wait time for that matter. More often than not, you'll probably be waiting around 5-10 minutes tops before you board a boat. Now, during holiday seasons when it's super crowded, when everything else is closed in Epcot, then Grand Fiesta gets a little bit of a line. But most of the time this ride doesn't have or need lightning lane capabilities. You can hit up Grand Fiesta at any time throughout the day, and even though I'll for sure ride Grand Fiesta at least once per trip, you do not need to prioritize this one for a beginning or end of the day ride through, aka when ride times are at their most manageable. As long as Grand Fiesta is up and running, you'll get on without having to resort to your Heads Up app to stave off the boredom. Pros on this one, best for those looking for a relaxing boat ride. You can ride with kids of any age, and you can usually hop in line whenever and get on with little to no wait. Cons, it's probably not the best for those wanting something more thrilling, but I mean, why wouldn't you love Grand Fiesta Tour? If you don't love Grand Fiesta Tour, I don't understand. And it might feel a bit dated for some, but... For those of us that are 80s kids, it's just glorious. Okay, overall on this one, an 8 out of 10. Okay, next we're coming up to Do You Want to Build a Snowman in the Middle of Orlando? Once upon a time, the Norway Pavilion had a troll-infested boat ride called Maelstrom, which was a absolute delight. But in 2016, the Norway Pavilion replaced Maelstrom with a troll-infested boat ride. But they're different, I promise. For starters, the trolls in the Frozen Ever After ride are the friendly trolls and won't put a dark and dreary curse on you and your children and your children's children. Instead, they're here to tell you a story about the day Princess Anna saved her sister Queen Elsa from that scumbag Prince Hans. We're rooting for you, Hans. We were all rooting for you. Now, the ride doesn't actually go through the plot of the movie. Instead, you've arrived just in time for the anniversary of Anna saved her sister and helped release Arendelle from its eternal winter. So get ready to celebrate. The only scene you'll see that directly parallels into the first movie is Elsa's big musical number, where you'll enter her ice palace, listen to her sing the song. How's it go again? Haven't really heard it before. Before she waves her and sends you flying backwards again not shooting you backwards just a little push in the opposite direction now this ride features audio animatronics of all the characters except hans forget you hans but it lacks a major story or conflict making the ride feel like there's something missing overall however there are some unexpected thrills here like the tiny drop at the end of the ride after you come face to face with marshmallow the snow monster the thrills aren't huge, but if you have a nervous rider in your group, you might want to prep them ahead of time so they aren't taken off guard. Now, because this is the Frozen Sisters we're talking about here, this ride can get super popular. Before, you used to only be able to access Frozen Ever After's Lightning Lane through a separate IAS purchase, but now Frozen Ever After is available with the other Genie Plus options until August 7th. 
If you still don't want to pay the Genie Plus price for a shorter queue, I'd recommend getting in line for this ride when Harmonious is happening, if you don't mind skipping out on the nighttime spectacular. Waits for Frozen Ever After usually plummet by the end of the day. <laughs> now, Bria's next line here is, everyone be impressed, I talked about something Frozen related and didn't add a let it go pun once. Baby steps, AJ, baby steps. <laughs> Thank you, Bria, noted. <laughs> now, pros for this ride. Best for the big Frozen fans of the group. And catchy music, state-of-the-art animatronics, and happy-go-lucky vibes. I will say state-of-the-art animatronics for like five years ago. Cons on this one, not best for those looking for a ride with a storyline or conflict. And Marshmallow and the end of Ride Mini Drop could be intimidating for younger kiddos, but it's really not that bad. Overall, 8 out of 10 on this one. Yes, we're ranking it higher than Test Rack. You can take that up with us in the comments, my friends. Okay, moving on to another brand new ride. Before Cosmic Rewind swooped onto the scene, the new kid on the block was Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. Remy's opened last year for the kickoff of Disney World's 50th anniversary celebration and drew in huge crowds of fans right from the get-go. And it still draws in huge crowds, even though it's no longer the shiny new toy of the park. This trackless dark ride originated in Disneyland Paris before making its merry way to Epcot, and where better to have it take up residence than the France Pavilion? For this ride, you'll jump into the most adorable rat-shaped ride vehicle you've ever laid eyes on, because I'm sure you've come across many of those in your life, to follow Remy and friends as honorary rats while Remy tries to whip up his famous ratatouille dish, all while trying to escape the clutches of the greasy-looking Chef Skinner. Anyone else think he looks greasy? Just us? I think he's pretty greasy. Now, this ride incorporates both screen technology and larger-than-life props to make you feel like you've really shrunk down to the size of a rat. It's also kind of 4D, because there's a few parts where you'll actually feel something. So there's one part where he's mopping up the floor and you get splashed with mop water, which is disgusting. And there's another part where you're actually under an oven and they turn on the oven and so it gets all hot. So that's kind of fun. And it's a charming family-friendly ride for all ages, but is it worth the one to two hour wait it's been pushing lately? No. Much like Frozen Ever After, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure had Lightning Lane services that were once only available through an IAS purchase, but now that Cosmic Rewind is in the picture, you can get a Lightning Lane for Remy's on the regular Genie Plus list until August 7th. That being said, if you purchase Genie Plus, you'll want to make sure Remy is your number one priority. These are the Lightning Lane reservations that will get swiped up the fastest in Epcot. If you're planning on staying at a Disney World-owned resort or select Good Neighbor Hotel, during your upcoming trip, I highly recommend using the resort's early theme park entry benefit to help cut down your Remy wait time without having to pay for the Genie Plus service. And I will reiterate a very, very good tip from one of our readers and viewers to try to enter into the park from the International Gateway if you want to ride Remy first during that early entry time because if you enter the park through the regular main entrance, it's going to take you a long time to get all the way back across the park. It's literally the farthest you can kind of walk from the main entrance to get over to the back of France. And the line's going to be really long. You're basically going to spend your whole early entry half hour getting over there and standing in line. But if you come in through the International Gateway entrance, you're going to get in line much, much faster. Now, pros for this one. Best for those looking for a dark ride the whole family can enjoy, and great use of both screen technology and larger than life props. Plus, it's still super cool in Walt Disney World to be riding those newfangled trackless rides. You've got some trackless situations going on at Rise of the Resistance, at Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, and at Remy. Other Disney parks have other trackless rides, but these are our first ones and they're pretty cool. Cons, not best for those who don't want to wait forever for a rather short ride. And it's, I mean, it's a cute ride, but it's not something that, you know, life changing for you. And although Chef Skinner can get pretty intense, you're not going to find a lot of thrills attached to this ride. Overall, 8 out of 10. Okay, time to head back over to Future World, which is no longer called Future World, I know, but we're going to World Nature, Land, Air, and Sea. Epcot covers those elemental bases over in the World Nature section of the park. All three rides featured in World Nature are peaceful, relaxing, and might learn you a thing or two along the way. All of them also have lightning lanes, but truth be told, you don't need them. You might for one ride in this list, but for the other two, nope, no, uh, no lightning lanes necessary. Let's start with Exhibit A, The Sea is with Nemo and Friends. The Sea is with Nemo and Friends is an omni-mover dark ride where you'll have to help Marlin, Dory, and the rest of the big blue friends find Nemo again. I don't know what to tell you, Marlin. I think Nemo might need a timeout or something. Now, this one's a cute ride. You'll float past a shark intervention, navigate an infestation of jellyfish, ride the EAC with a bunch of groovy sea turtles, 
It's not a life-changing ride or anything, but it gives me a lot of under the sea journey of the Little Mermaid vibes, a ride which you can find over in Magic Kingdom. Now this is another one of those rides if you have a little kid, you're gonna ride this like 10 million times over and over and over again. But just to note that little ones might get kind of skittish when it comes to the anglerfish animatronic and those toothy peckish shark friends, but otherwise they'll more than likely love seeing all the Nemo crew come together at the end as they swim side by side along real fishies straight from the large aquarium from Seabase Alpha. Better yet, you can get a closer look at these fish after the ride since it'll exit you out into the sea base area to learn more about the sharks, rays, anemones, and other aquatic creatures living within the facility. Heads up, quick side note, if you do have a very, very active toddler, which I had, this is one of the best places to let them get a little bit of energy out, just let them sort of run around because there's no real playgrounds in Epcot. Sometimes there are for festivals, but this is an indoor area and usually upstairs in the aquarium, there aren't too many people for them to sort of run into. So it's a good place for them to just run free. Now, am I advocating you let your kids just like run around all the time? No, I'm saying if there aren't that many people around, this is a good place to let them like not be like in their stroller and like tied down, right? Okay, we got it. Now, the queue line is ridiculously long for Nemo, and I don't mean it racks up a long wait time. More often than not, you'll just walk right on up and jump into your clamobile, but the queue line was originally built to hold way bigger crowds, so you'll have to keep swimming, swimming, swimming up to the front. You're definitely gonna get your steps in walking through this queue. And honestly, the queue's kinda creepy. I, I don't know why, it just is. But pros for this one, best for those who are big Nemo fans and wanna find Nemo, cause second time's a charm, I guess. And it exits out into Seabase Alpha, which is home for over 8,000 aquatic friends and a super cool place to walk around and learn. Everybody loves an aquarium, right? Right. And cons for this one, not the best for those looking for something more exciting and can potentially be intimidating for little littles. Overall, gonna give this one a seven out of 10, just because with cognitive dissonance and how many times I've written this, I have to pretend I really, really like it. Okay, sorry, I spent a long time talking about that ride. My apologies. We're moving on. Living with the land. If you thought Nemo was a slow going ride, just wait till you jump aboard Living with the Land. Living with the Land is a 14 minute boat journey that's half dark ride and half tour through Epcot's working greenhouses. This ride will teach you all about Disney's innovative growing methods and fish farming techniques all while exploring the history of human impact on our planet while using different cultivating practices. What's super cool about these greenhouses is that Epcot uses the produce and fish they raise here in their restaurants, especially the Garden Grill upstairs, as well as many of the outdoor kitchens around the world showcased during the festivals. Adults might be ready to paint their thumbs green after this ride, but living with the land might get a bit tedious for younger riders wondering where their favorite Disney characters might be hiding out. This ride does have a lightning lane, but you usually don't need it. The line is usually pretty non-existent here, and if it ever does produce a longer wait, it turns into headliner news because you're in for a miserably busy day at the parks. Pros on this one, best for those needing to kick up their feet and learn some facts about gardening while they're at it. Don't actually kick up your feet because you'll get yelled at. And plants grown here are usually directly used in the restaurants and food booths around Epcot. It is a very, very, very relaxing ride. Again, this will massage your brain like nothing else. You definitely need this in the middle of a park day. Cons, not best for groups with squirmy kiddos who could get bored easily and no thrills, no real storyline, just good old agriculture and education. But still gonna give this one an eight out of 10 because it's the best. Okay. Next up, Soarin' Around the World. Okay, I'm pretty sure that Patrick Walburton was born to do the safety spiel for this ride. And I don't, I mean, he does other things. I guess he's an actor or whatever. But honestly, this is why he's on this planet at the moment. But in all seriousness, Soarin' Around the World is a multi-leveled flight simulator that gives you aerial views of around the world. You'll glide over scenes like the Sydney Harbor, Mount Kilimanjaro, the Great Wall of China, and several other destinations that'll make you go, okay, I'm booking my next vacation immediately. The very cool and very boring trivia about this ride is that Disney Imagineers actually used Erector sets to figure out how the physics of this ride was going to work. It's very, very cool. And yes, I am 1000% an Epcot nerd. Okay, the ride incorporates smellitizers too. So you again, you've got that sort of like 4D thing. Unlike Figment and his infamous skunk spray, you will smell good smells here, like fresh grass and salty island seas. There is a dirt smell in this one, but it's not offensive. Now the soundtrack of this ride is one of those songs you will want to listen to on repeat, but you also don't because you're afraid you'll tarnish the sanctity of the sound. It is just so good. But a big complaint about this ride is seating. It's great that Soren can hold so many guests at a time, but if you're on the second or third row of the ride, expect your view to be partially obstructed by the dangling feet above you. 
Also, if you're sitting toward the far left or far right end of your row, some of these scenes will look pretty distorted, especially the Eiffel Tower, which looks very bendy. Our favorite spot is the first row middle section, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. Though you're not gonna see feet, the top of the screen is still kind of clipped at the top and could be distracting for some. So the recommendation here is usually gonna be sitting in B1. Now, if you're afraid of heights, that top row might also not be best for you. Row one towers above the room at 50 feet off the ground. This ride is a good Genie Plus option to grab if you have Genie Plus already purchased, but I wouldn't get Genie Plus with the sole intention of using it for Soarin' first. Waits for this one are on average around 30 to 40 minutes and sometimes even lower than that, so keep an eye on the My Disney Experience app and hit up Soarin' when you see the wait times drop to a reasonable time for you and your group. Pros for Soren, best for those who want an aerial view of our picturesque world, which of course is why you go to Epcot, and has an epic soundtrack and Patrick Warburton as your safety spiel guy. Cons, not best for those who are afraid of heights and can have an obstructed or distorted view depending on where you're seated. But overall, we're gonna give this one a nine out of 10. Okay, quick overview time. Epcot wins when it comes to having the most laid back educational rides. You're more than welcome to purchase Disney Genie Plus to guarantee lower wait times during your visit. You're welcome, but it's really not necessary. Even on busier Epcot days, you can usually manage all the rides the park has to offer, especially if you start hitting them up in the morning. Use your afternoon to chill and meander around World Showcase that finish up the ones you didn't get to the first time by the evening. However, if you want to ride Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, make sure you're on your A game and ready to grab a boarding pass at either 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. Important note, again, you have to be in Epcot to snag that 1 p.m. reservation time, and you have to have a park pass reservation for Epcot for either of those. But you can pretty much be anywhere with a strong Wi-Fi or cell signal to get the 7 a.m. one. This park has a bit of every type of ride for every type of rider. A little thrill here, a little education there, and a lot of boat rides everywhere. Of course, you know I'm an Epcot kid. I'm an 80s Epcot kid. I love this place. So let us know in the comments what your thoughts are, what rides you think you definitely need a Genie Plus reservation for, and which ones you're okay to wait for. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching everyone. We are going to be ranking all the rides in all the parks. So go watch our other videos next. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog and we'll see you real soon.